Hi, and welcome to part two of our membrane structure and function portion of the matter unit. In this video, we're going to talk about the functions of the cell membrane. If you haven't watched the video on the structure of the cell membrane, you definitely want to do that before you watch this video. I figured I'd start this one out with uh, this process. This is a medical process, which you may have some familiarity with. This individual is getting an IV line put into their vein so that they can get medicine. And one of the most common reasons why you might need an IV is because you are dehydrated, in which case they're going to give you a bag of fluid. And you might think that that fluid is just pure water, but in fact, it's actually not pure water. I've actually blown up the relevant information here. It's actually a bag of salt water, which is kind of interesting if you think about it, because you probably learned not to go and drink the ocean. But at the same time, your body is full of salt water. It's just nowhere near as concentrated as the ocean water is. If you did get a bag of pure water put into your arm, it would be just as bad as getting a bag of concentrated salt water put into your arm. The concentrated salt water would do what you see over on the left. It would cause the cells in your bloodstream to lose all of their water and shrivel up, which would make it much harder for them to function. But the pure water would do what you see over on the right in this image. It would cause the cells to swell and in some cases even burst, which would of course disrupt their function. What you need is you need fluid that's at the same concentration as the concentration of your blood. And that's what is in an IV bag of fluid. And that's what would lead to the middle picture that you see here with healthy functional red blood cells, neither overinflated nor underinflated. This all has to do with the movement of molecules across the membranes of cells. And that's what we're talking about here. So the question that we're trying to answer in this video is how do living things control the transport of matter? And in this video, we're going to talk about mechanisms of cellular transport, and then we'll talk about tonicity. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about bulk transport, but all of this is going to involve this organelle, the star of the show, the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is selectively permeable. What we mean by this is that things can move across it. That's what we mean by the permeable part, but not just anything can move across it. It is selective in what it allows to go through. And that way it acts as a filter. It's actually a much fancier filter than any filter that humans have ever been able to create. Small molecules that are nonpolar can go right across the bilayer. Examples of these things would be things like oxygen or carbon dioxide. These molecules have no problem diffusing through the hydrophobic tail region of the bilayer, and so they can go back and forth across the bilayer directly. But larger molecules or molecules that are polar or that have charges cannot go through the bilayer directly. For those molecules to move across the membrane, they need to go through a protein channel in the membrane. And one of the major protein components of any cell membrane are the series of protein channels that allow specific substances to cross from one side of the membrane to the other. There are two major types of transport that are functioning at the level of the cell. There's passive transport and active transport. Passive transport is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Active transport is the opposite, taking molecules from where there aren't very many of them and moving them to where there are a lot of them. The shorthand of putting something in square brackets just means the concentration of that substance. It's something that you should have some familiarity with because you will see it used in this course. It doesn't require any energy to move molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. All we need to do is wait and those molecules will over time spread out from where there are a lot of them to where there are fewer of them until such time as there's an equal concentration across the entire area. It does, however, require an input of energy to move molecules from a low concentration to a high concentration because you are going against the so-called concentration gradient. You are moving substances against the way that they would naturally move if you just left them to their own devices. In terms of passive transport, there are two major mechanisms that we see in the cell membrane. There's simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. The main difference here being that simple diffusion occurs across the bilayer and facilitated diffusion uses a protein channel. But in both cases, molecules are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Active transport is accomplished entirely through the action of proteins. Let's talk about each one a little bit more in depth. Simple diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration over time through the bilayer directly. All you need to do is wait long enough and molecules will diffuse through the bilayer, assuming that they can. 
But as we discussed, many molecules don't have the chemistry necessary to move through the bilayer proper. And in those situations, facilitated diffusion is required. Facilitated diffusion uses proteins, specifically channel proteins and carrier proteins that are specific to particular molecules to allow those molecules to diffuse across the membrane. Each of these proteins is specific to one particular substance diffusing across the membrane. Different substances cannot use the same channel or carrier protein to move from one side of the membrane to the other. Active transport is a little bit more complicated. We're gonna look at one particular example of active transport that's been really well researched because it plays a major role in animal nervous systems. This is the movement of sodium and potassium across the membrane through the action of a protein called the sodium potassium pump. In this series of images, sodium is represented as the orange hexagons and potassium is represented as the yellow ovals. Notice that there's already a concentration gradient for these substances as shown over on the right in our diagram. There is more sodium outside of the cell at the top of the graphic than there is inside. And there's more potassium inside of the cell at the bottom than there is on the outside. In order to move substances against their concentration gradient, we're going to need to use the sodium potassium pump. What you see in the first image is one conformation of the sodium potassium pump. In this conformation, it is open to the inside of the cell, and the only substance that can bind to it at this point is the sodium ion. Once sodium does bind to the pump in this conformation, energy is going to be used, which is shown here as this molecule of ATP providing the energy necessary. This is going to cause a conformational change in the protein and now open it up to the extracellular side, the outside of the cell. This conformational change is also going to disrupt the binding of the sodium to the pump, and open up sites for potassium ions to bind to the pump. Potassium ions from the outside of the cell are now going to bind to the pump, and once that's accomplished, the protein is then going to go back to its original conformation, open to the inside of the cell, and expelling the potassium ions into the cell. The action of this pump will maintain a concentration gradient across the cell membrane. By continuing to operate this pump, you'll continue to establish a higher concentration of sodium outside of the cell and a higher concentration of potassium inside of the cell. This is just one example of active transport through the action of the sodium potassium pump. There are other versions of active transport as well, some of which use ATP, but some of which do not. So for instance, in this particular example, the passive transport of sodium down its concentration gradient is used to drive the active transport of an amino acid against its concentration gradient. This is another typical strategy that cells use to accomplish the process of active transport. But in all cases, you need to have some sort of energy source, whether it be the chemical energy released through the hydrolysis of ATP or the electrostatic energy released here as sodium moves down its concentration gradient. Let's pause here and talk about one of the major misconceptions that people have when considering the process of cellular transport. And that's that transport is an emergent property. Molecular motion is totally constant and totally random. Any individual molecule is going to move in a totally random direction. It's only when you have groups of molecules that you can start to analyze their behavior in terms of the overall direction of their motion compared to their concentration gradient. This simulation is going to illustrate that point. The individual molecule at the top will move in random directions once we begin the simulation. And each of the individual molecules in the middle will also move in random directions. But because we're starting with more molecules on the left than on the right, over the course of the simulation, molecules from the left will come to randomly occupy the space on the right. The bottom of the simulation is just showing what we would expect to see as macroscopic creatures if these were molecules of a dye, for instance, moving into the area. Let's play the simulation and you can see what I'm talking about. Notice that the individual molecule is just randomly moving around. It's only through the action of the group of molecules that we actually get the diffusion process occurring. Let's move on from the specifics of the molecular mechanisms of transport to talk about tonicity. Tonicity is a way of referring to the concentrations of solutes and solvents in different solutions. There are three different types of tonicity. In a hypertonic solution, the solution has a higher solute concentration and a lower solvent concentration than another reference solution. Cells placed into a hypertonic solution will tend to lose water. An isotonic solution is a solution with an equal solute concentration and an equal solvent concentration as compared to the reference solution. Cells placed into an isotonic solution will neither gain nor lose any water. And finally, a hypotonic solution is one with a lower solute concentration and a higher solvent concentration than the reference solution. Cells that are placed into a hypotonic solution will tend to gain water. Animal-like cells are adapted to exist optimally in isotonic solutions where they neither gain nor lose water. Plant-like cells are adapted to optimally exist in hypotonic solutions where they continually gain water. Animal-like cells placed into a hypotonic solution run the risk of bursting like our red blood cells at the beginning of this video. But plant-like cells do not run that risk because of the cell wall that surrounds them and provides the structural support necessary to keep them from popping. 
To talk about one other misconception that we often see with students when discussing tonicity, it's the notion that tonicity relationships are comparative. A solution can't be hypertonic or isotonic or hypotonic unless you are comparing it to another solution. In the examples that we've discussed so far, we've been comparing different solutions to the solution of the cytoplasm inside of the cells and looking at their effects. But you simply cannot describe a solution as hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic without talking about the solution that you're comparing it to. This is a fine point, but it's definitely a mistake that we see students make all the time. Let's end this discussion with a brief conversation about bulk transport. Bulk transport refers to the movement of large amounts of substances into or out of the cell. This does not happen across the cell membrane. Instead, the cell membrane surrounds the substance and the substance is brought into the cell enclosed in a compartment membrane, which is generally referred to as a vesicle. There are different types of endocytosis depending upon the type of molecule being brought in, but you don't really need to worry about that. At the same time, I've left the terms on this diagram so you can get the vocabulary you need if you want to investigate these things further. Cells also have a process by which they can export large molecules, which basically looks like endocytosis in reverse, and that is called exocytosis. In exocytosis, a vesicle containing whatever the cell wants to secrete will fuse with the plasma membrane and export the contents out of the cell. Thanks so much for watching our discussion about cellular transport. Please make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can compare modes of passive transport with modes of active transport. Make sure you can predict which mode of transport will be used for a particular molecule in a particular situation. And make sure you can identify the tonicity relationships among different solutions and use them to predict the movement of solutes and solvent, the solvent, of course, always being water in biological systems. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.